Now, the next topic is one that's probably one of the hardest topics for investors. We're going to talk about financing options. Um, and it's going to be incumbent upon you to understand what these options are and where can you obtain some of these options because they are going to be looking to you and you want to be a value add to this investor. And this is probably one of the key areas that you can add value by either suggesting a financing option or suggesting that you have people that can do this financing option. So the first one I wanna talk about is this thing called portfolio loans. Now, portfolio loans, maybe you've heard of them, maybe you haven't. Most lenders in the residential world that loan money will lend a buyer money and then they will sell the loan to the secondary market so that they can free up or get back their capital and if you think about it, they are a, I don't want to say fix and flip, but it's the same concept. They s give you a hundred grand, you sign an IOU, they sell that IOU to the secondary market, they get their hundred grand back, and then they do it again. All right. That is the traditional method of most residential mortgages. However, there are some people or some lenders, let's say, that are comfortable with keeping the loan in house, meaning they are not going to sell it to Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae or Jenny Mae or Bernie Mac or Chili Mac or Big Mac or any of those other Macs we know. They portfolio their loans. If that is the case, they don't necessarily need to meet the requirements of Freddie Mac. All right so they can set their own terms so to speak that allows that investor to then maybe get a different loan to value get a little higher interest rate if they've got more properties so if you can find a lender that portfolios their loans that might be a better access to money than a traditional mortgage now Rule of thumb, I'm going to just go out here and tell you is a lot of credit unions portfolio their loans. They don't sell them. Teachers Credit Union, Indiana Credit Union, uh, Naval Credit Union actually makes loans. Um, so those kind of places might be a better first stop than say a conventional lender like Chase Bank. The second one on here, FHA loans. Whoa, whoa, Raymond, what are you talking about, FHA loans? You can't have an investor loan for FHA. Exactly. You are 100% correct. FHA loans are geared towards uh, non-investors, right? Well, you might be right because remember, FHA actually allows you to buy a one to four unit property. One, two, three, four. What that means is somebody that wants to buy a four unit quad and live in one of the units can use an FHA loan and rent the other three out. And just like FHA, well, it is FHA, you still could potentially have the three and a half percent down. And the downside is there's still going to be some PMI if you're not putting 20% down, um, which will increase your payment, maybe eat into your cash flow a little bit. But there are three other units. So once again, FHA is potentially possible because they will do one to four unit. Remember that? 203k loans, same thing. It's the rehab loan, that's the slang name that we call it, for one to four units. So once again, if somebody finds a four unit, maybe it's dilapidated or run down, they might use an FHA 203k loan to buy the property and get money to rehab. Now, 
downside is there is a it's a limited amount um, 35,000 I think is the maximum so if they're buying something that needs rehab that maybe is 40 50 60 100 grand this may not be an option but I'm just saying this is still a potential option now remember got to live in it so if somebody says hey I want to buy a four unit I'm going to live in the you know unit A and rent out B C and D 203k loans might be an option keep that in mind owner financing purchase money mortgages is what they call this if you're in the investment world there's a slang term for this called a carry back a carry back this is where the owner makes a loan to the buyer at the closing table for the balance. Now, there's some advantages and disadvantages. Once again, it becomes like a second loan, so it increases the leverage, which could decrease cash flow. Typically, they're short term, three, five years, higher interest rate. Let me give you an example if you don't know what I mean. So my mythical $100,000 house, somebody goes out and gets an 80% loan to value, that is 80 grand, and they've got 10 grand. Well, they're 10 grand short in the purchase, right? Well, that 10 grand can be carried back through a purchase money mortgage, i.e. owner financing, that would allow that deal to close and now that investor's only got 10 grand into it. He has a first, an 80% loan to value first, and then he has this 10 grand owner financing. So instead of making a $500 payment a month to Chase Bank for the 80% loan to value, he would make that payment and maybe another 25 or $100 to the original owner on this owner occup I'm sorry, owner financing purchase money mortgage. Like I said, looks like a second mortgage, so it ups the leverage, maybe eats into the cash flow. Hard money loan, hard money loan, I wanna mix with uh, the next one below it called private money because there technically is a difference between these and the difference usually lies in the relationship between the person loaning the money and the borrower. Hard money loan typically is our institutions that are out there that don't have a relationship currently with your investor and they will loan high or they will loan money at high interest rates short term. I've seen hard money loans at 14%, 15%, but what they do is they give that investor ca access to cash typically quicker than a true loan so that you as an agent can go out and make a uh, offer and say, hey, dude, we can close this in four or five days or 10 days and not 40 like your other uh, offer is that's on the table. So <clears throat> hard money loans are better for fix and flip than buy and hold because the short term of the hard money and the high interest rate Typically, the investor wants to go in and get their capital back to pay that hard money loan off so as not to have the note called due in three years. Whereas a buy and hold person, how they, they're going to have to refinance that guy out or they're typically paying that high interest rate for a long time. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> contrary to that or very similar to that is this thing called private money. Private money, typically by definition, is somebody that has a relationship with the borrower and therefore the terms become a lot more friendly. Still the same concept, all right? Still the same concept. They borrow money for short term. Uh, interest rates typically aren't higher because of the relationship between the two people. Once again, very good for fix and flip, not really good for buy and hold most of the time. I personally had a private money loan from a friend of mine that was an attorney who had all kinds of money and literally I 
showed him the benefits of loaning me the money to buy a house and I was paying him at the time was a high interest rate of, uh, he was getting some something stupid at the bank and I convinced him into 6% interest um, on his private money. Now the advantage to me was I didn't have to go through the hoops of qualifying for a loan that was going to be sold to Freddie Mac later. So whether it was a 680, a 780, an 880, or just 80 credit score, the loan was based on the relationship I had between myself and Ron. He knew who I was. We were good friends. We smoked cigars together. He had the money available. And we set it up on a five-year private money loan. Every month, I just wrote a check to the First Bank of Ron, and he looked at it like, hey, $80,000 at a 5% return versus the same 80 grand sitting in my bank. It was a no-brainer for him. And then at five years, I sold the house, moved out, and the rest is history. So private money and hard money are virtually the same kind of concept. Like I said, the differentiating factor is hard money lenders are an institution that are doing it for a business and have no prior relationship with the borrower, where private money typically are single individuals that have ex access to excess cash and typically have a relationship and therefore the terms of the loan are a lot softer than say a hard money. Um, home equity financing, um, this is access. This is what they call pyramiding, pyramiding. This works great in commercial investing because what happens, as I told you earlier, how you can change the value of a commercial building rather quickly compared to changing the value of a residential property. So let's go back to the example that I mentioned earlier. You buy a $500,000 commercial building that's sitting vacant and you lease up all of the space and now the value of that building is, let's make up an easy math, $1 million. You've now created equity in that building of 500 grand. Now you literally could go in and borrow $300,000, bring your leverage up to 80%, right? 500 for the first, you say you borrowed it all, and 30 for the second brings you at 80. So now you've got 300,000, you use it to buy the next property that is vacant, do your magic again, bring the value up, create a bunch of equity, borrow the equity, go to building number three. That is called pyramiding through refinance. Pyramiding through refinance. That's actually a great strategy for a lot of commercial investors. It's a little harder in the residential world because the methodology of creating the value in residential is not as quick as it is in the commercial world. But the whole thing still is available. Uh, the last one there, which seems to be termed SH, I have no idea, <laughs> are just plain commercial loans. There are commercial lenders out there. Now, these are not what most of you probably are thinking about when you're talking about, oh, I need to go to Huntington Bank or Salem Bank. Uh, and get a loan for my house. No, these are commercial lenders that deal specifically in special types of loans, bridge loans, uh, blanket loans, uh, those kind of loans. And those are people that you are going to have to seek out specifically. Win Trust out of Chicago is a great example. They deal with commercial buildings. Now, the good thing is with commercial loans, it is typically based on the value of the building, not as much on the individual person. So let's break that down a little bit. When you go and buy a house for 100000 the most important thing the lender wants to see 
is your ability to repay because you have a job that covers the payments every month. When you go and start buying a four and five million dollar building, it is less about your ability to repay from your income and more ability, more about the ability of the building to be able to repay. So you would, hey, I'm buying a 30,000 square foot retail strip center at a $4 million price, but when I get at least, it's going to be worth 10 million. Now commercial lenders are like, okay, at $10 million, you can cover the loan and make profit. So they're going to look more at the building and less at you. There's an old joke that I tell people, it's probably easier to borrow five to 10 million than it is to borrow five to 10,000, right? Because that five to 10 grand, they're gonna look at that person, can you pay it back? At five or 10 million, they're gonna be looking at, okay, strip center, you're gonna rent it out to retail people, uh, Subway, they're a very strong tenant. Yeah, that building's got the ability to repay the loan. So. Commercial loans, while not ubiquitous, I mean, you're not going to see them everywhere like you would local banks and stuff like that. They tend to be more driven by valuation of the building and less about the person. Now, I'm not saying that that person is going to go in there with two bankruptcies and a 510 credit score. They still got to be a strong borrower, but if they're not going to look solely at that borrower Oh, well, does he have a job that can repay a $4 million loan? No, very few people do. <laughs> it's because they're looking at the building. All right, so these are some options, and I'm suggesting now if you want to be in that investing world and you want to help your investors and value add, you probably need to take this list and go out there and see if you can find some of these different types of loans. You may have connections to private money, you may deal with some hard money guys. You may f go out and meet with some commercial lenders so that you can build this team so that when your investor comes in and goes, well, here's what I want to do. You're like, great, I can help you. And by the way, I've already got access to a good commercial lender out of Chicago. Uh, I can hook you up with them. That is going to be the value add that you want so that an investor goes, dude, that agent was genius. Uh, it was kind of like a one-stop shop. I found this great strip center for sale and my guy, i.e. the uh, agent, already had a lender for me, all right? So financing, make sure you understand it and understand the types. We've talked about seven or eight here. I'm sure there's probably another seven or eight we didn't even touch on. So let's keep rolling.